we all know that the service locator pattern is bad, and you should feel bad if you use it. However, in a recent video, I actually showed that you could go use this as a solution to some WPF challenges. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. I've built a ton of WPF applications, and there's a few things that we have to work against inside of the WPF framework if we're trying to do things like dependency injection. Now, in a previous video, which I'll link up here if you haven't seen it, I did show a way that you could work around some of these things using a service locator pattern, but I did offer the disclaimer that I really don't like to do that. So in this video, I'm gonna show you an alternative where we can move away from a service locator pattern and instead, do things a little bit more manually. So it's a different trade-off, but I actually prefer this way. Unfortunately, it still does work against some of the WPF recommended ways that we should go approach things. If that sounds interesting, remember to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and get rid of this service locator pattern. On my screen from the previous video, which I linked before, if you haven't seen it, please go check it. Otherwise, if you understand service locator pattern and why we don't want to use it, let's just continue on. We do have a converter here, and it's using a service locator pattern because converters inside of WPF, when you go to create them the traditional way, which is from a resource dictionary, you aren't able to pass in constructor parameters. So if we go to put anything here, like just a Boolean, for example, like you can't do this because it needs to have a constructor that has no parameters. Just to show you quickly, if we go over to the XAML, this converter, the Nix Cool Converter class, needs to have no constructor parameters. So it can have a constructor, just no parameters. What we introduced in the previous video was that we could use a service locator pattern. So what I end up doing is having a static property that we can set the service provider for this particular type, and that way it can go resolve it when you construct it. Now, like I said, I don't like doing this. Service locator pattern is an anti-pattern. It is quite the opposite of dependency injection. You are literally creating something and then it is asking for dependencies, like it's pulling them in, versus the dependency injection framework passing them in for us. But that's to work around the fact that we can't have constructor parameters. What if we said, no way, we're fighting against the WPF system, we want constructor parameters. Well, that's what we're gonna do in this case. So we're gonna get rid of the service locator pattern part. So we're gonna start deleting these things, but that means that we need to be able to pass in the string formatting helper. Again, I should call this out in this demonstration for this converter, the string formatting helper and this converter are both extremely simple. So if you're going, Nick, this code is so dumb and silly, why don't you just refactor it into something and avoid this whole problem? You were totally right for this particular situation. I just want to give you examples so that you can compare them to your own code base very easily. In this case, any converter that you want to make that needs any dependency passed in. I don't care what it is. These are the patterns that we're trying to play with here, so I just wanted to keep it very simple. We're gonna pass in our string formatting helper. That's the one dependency that we have for our converter here. You can see it's passed in and assigned, but this will not work when we go to run it and it's not gonna work because it has a constructor parameter. To go clean up more things on our main window, what we were doing in the previous video, this is set up to use dependency injection, this window, but that's where we're gonna set that service provider. So the converter itself basically was avoiding dependency injection because we were creating it in XAML. And that's gonna bring us to where this kind of breaks down and moves against some WPF practices because we're not gonna do the binding that we have in XAML anymore. If I jump back to the XAML file, we're gonna get rid of this converter right out of the XAML. But that means that this binding that we have down here on the content, this is no longer gonna be applicable for us. And that kind of sucks because one of the really cool things that we get in WPF is having an editor window with a preview, all these fun tools that we can go use. We have this, I don't know if you like this syntax, I personally don't, but if you're familiar with the binding syntax, you can go use it, especially if you're familiar with it. But it's not gonna work for us because we can't do the binding with the converter in the XAML if we want that constructor parameter. Unless you know of another way, in which case, leave a comment, I'm happy to go check that out. If we jump back, now we have a window and it has our control on it, but there is no binding. We don't need that there anymore either. What we need to be able to do is set up the binding manually 
and pass in the converter as a dependency. That would mean that here we can say Nick's cool converter needs to get passed in. So now we have that. This will get wired up through dependency injection, which I will explain in a moment because we're using a NuGet package called Screwtor to do that for us. But I'm going to go wire up the binding. Before we continue on, this is just a quick reminder that I do have courses available on Dome Train. If you're just getting started in your programming journey and you want to learn C Sharp, you can head over to Dome Train. I have a Getting Started in C Sharp course. It's approximately five hours of content taking you from absolutely no experience to being able to program in C Sharp. And after that, I have my Deep Dive course, which will take you to the next level with another six hours of content so that you can start building basic applications. Head over to Dome Train and check it out. Let's head back to the video. So to explain what's going on with this binding, this is what we had on the screen before when we had it in XAML, but I'm going to make a new binding. The parameter that gets passed in here is the path of the binding. So we were binding to the cool level. I'm terrible with naming, as you might have seen, but I'm binding to the cool level on our view model. Okay, so that's what this part is right here. It's just the path to the binding. The converter that we're going to use is assigned on this property here for this object initializer. And that's, again, it's passed in right through here. So we go do that. And then what we need to do is on the cool label itself, which if you didn't notice, and I probably should have called it out, I gave a name to the label that we want to go configure this binding for that allows us to reference it in the code behind, which is right here on line 25. We're going to set the binding. And now bindings work on dependency properties and then a binding object in this case. So content property is the dependency property of the label's content property. It's a little bit confusing to say out loud. We don't just do this cool label dot content because this isn't a dependency property. The dependency property is this. And to prove it, if I press F12, you can see it's literally an instance of a dependency property. OK, so we need to pass that in and then we give it the binding. What we've done so far is we've continued to pass things in through constructors, right? So this is how dependency injection generally works through constructor parameter passing generally. So main window, we are passing in the view model that was already set up. Now we're going to be able to inject this cool converter and we got rid of the XAML that was preventing us from doing this dependency injection. Now we can go create the binding manually. This is the part that kind of sucks, right? You're not using XAML, especially if you're familiar with it, but we can go do it in code. It's really not that complicated. And this allows us to get that dependency injection. But I need to explain how these things are wired up because if you're using a different system, your dependency injection doesn't stop here. You need to do a couple of other things to register things. To explain, you'll see that I have Nick's cool converter and I have the string formatting helper. These are two classes that I've created. And because I'm using a NuGet package called Screwdor, which I'll show you in just a moment, it's able to go look at the assemblies that I have in my bin directory and it will go register things automatically onto the dependency container. That means is I don't have to write code that registers this explicitly anywhere or this explicitly anywhere or even the main window. Because I use Screwdor with iService Collection, which is the built-in .NET dependency injection framework, because I use these things together, I don't need to go have explicit registrations. If you prefer to have explicit registrations, you will need to go add that, but that's why I'm skipping over that and you're not seeing the code for it because it is done automatically. I have the binding in place. We have the stuff passed in. And to show you appxaml.cs, this is where I'm doing all of that magic dependency registration. So Screwdor is a NuGet package. It allows us to go scan the assemblies. And I'm just doing a very naive scan through the folder that I'm running from to look for DLLs. You should do better checks than this. I'm just showing it for being quick. Then I'm registering all of the classes, so all the types that are in that assembly. We're going to add those classes in. We're going to register those classes as self, so they're immediate type plus the interfaces they implement, and they'll all be singletons. Again, this is a very big, broad registration. If this does not work for you, please use a different pattern. That's totally cool. But at this point, we should have everything registered and set up for dependency injection. So if I go run this now, we get functioning code, right? So you saw me remove the binding from the XAML, but we still are able to bind to the view model. It's still using the converter that we had to kind of prove it to you. If I stop this, if we take out the converter, is it going to work, right? It's different text. <laughs> it might not be obvious, but the other number was rounded. So if I stop it again, have a quick look, 421337, some easy numbers to remember, right? So we'll go run this again. 
and you can see that it's 42134 because our value converter that we are using dependency injection to get is doing that formatting for us. We have a quick peek, right? That's coming off of this dependency, which is now through dependency injection passed into here. All of these things together allow us to get dependency injection on value converters in WPF. This does go, like I said, against a little bit of the WPF patterns that we're used to seeing where we're defining things in XAML. But to call it out from all of my time working with XAML and WPF, I have found that, like I said in the intro to this video, I'm fighting against the framework a lot to get dependency injection to work in the way that I like. Otherwise, I find that some parts of the applications I build work very nicely with dependency injection, and then anything I'm doing with the user interface just falls apart. This is one strategy that I personally like to use. I end up avoiding some of the XAML, but I get better testability and better control, and that's my preferred way to go get this to work. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.